the last video, I took you all the way up to the point of showing you this particular folder with the sample ID that we had put when we submitted the job, tantalizing you, telling you that there were mysteries here that we were going to delve into. And then I just left you hanging. And I know you've been desperate to see what's in this particular folder. Well, today, all the secrets will be revealed. So let's click on this. And it opens up the results for those particular read pairs that were submitted with this sample. And the first thing you see is, oh, there's my sample identifier and alpha diversity CSV in HTML. Hey, wait a minute, didn't we see that earlier? So let's click on the up arrow here. And well, there's alpha diversity. It doesn't have the sequence identifier, but is this some strange bug in the system? Why do I have to see this twice? It is not a strange bug in the system. We only submitted one pair of reads for this particular job. And so when I am at this level within this folder, these are the alpha diversity statistics for this particular set of reads. If I go up, you notice this doesn't have the sequence identifier. These are the diversity statistics across the entire job. And what do I mean by that? If I had submitted more than one sample, if I'd submitted as many read files as I wanted to, this would compare the diversity across all of those. It's really valuable. And I'm going to show it to you in a later video what that looks like. But it gives you a way to quickly look across things and say, Oh, sample A had more of this, and sample B had more of this, and sample C looks a lot like A. So we're going to go into that. But because we only submitted one sample here, these diversity statistics are just for that one sample, and they will look identical to these. So we don't need to go in this right now. But there are these other folders here. So we need to figure out what those are and look at those. So what should we look at first? Well, I wanted to take you on a stroll down memory lane of this pipeline. And we started with whole genome sequencing and it went through showing you all the steps that are united in this pipeline to give you all of these results. The boxes that are outlined in red correspond to different folders that are per sample that you see. We have the read qualities, which is the fast QC, the aligning to the host genome, which is high SAT2, the classification, which uses Kraken2, which is the powerhouse of this whole pipeline, and the abundance estimation, which is Bracken. So I suggest that we go over these in the order that they occur in the pipeline. And because I control the mouse here, we're going to do what I want. And we're going to start with FastQC, which is read quality. So I click on that. And you see we have folders within folders. And within these folders are files within folders within folders. It's like a bunch of nesting dolls. But these are each a special surprise that you get to see more and more data for each of these folders. So it's like Christmas morning. OK, we have the raw reads and we have the reads that map to the host. So let's look at the raw reads first. So I'm going to click on this. And you notice that we have R1s and R2s. And we have FastQC HTML and FastQC zip. Well, the R1s and R2s, remember we have forward and reverse strands of the reads. So that's R1 and R2. The HTML is a more viewable format. So that's what we're going to look at. The FastQC zip is a zip file if you wish to download it. And within those, there are individual folders and files of the statistics that are united in the HTML. But if you're a real wonk and want to dig into it, download that and look at that. And I encourage you to do so if you so desire. But I want to look at the quality of these read files. 
So I highlight the row and then I click on the view icon and I'm going to give us a little more real estate here. This is what pops up. This is a fast QC report. And if you look at this, you've got the summary here of each of the things that it's measuring. And you'll notice that some of them have green checks, which mean look good. Some of them have a red X, which means it failed the quality estimate. And some of them have an exclamation point, which means this doesn't look like we would necessarily expect, and you should take a look at it. Okay, so let's start with the basic statistics. There is the sample identifier that I use, and it's telling me it's for that forward strand, and that's the FASTQ file. It was Illumina Sequencer, the total number of sequences, so it's like 1.3. It was 338 megabase pairs, None of the sequences were flagged as poor quality. The sequence length, and notice that it says sequence length distribution. It's generally looking for things that are all the same length. So there's some disparity in the sequence length here. And I will be able to see that that's why this drew a warning and the percent GC. Now, this is generally where this visualization for me tells me most of the stuff I look for when I look at the read files. And I'm interested in things being more in the green. If it's all in the red, I'm a bit concerned. But this is the per base sequence quality. And what it's looking at is the range of quality values across each position of the FASTQC file. So you can see the positions are down here. And the quality looks pretty good until you get up toward the end here. And these are called box and whisker plots. Now, the people who really care about this could probably, you might want to, this looks a little bit wonky. You might want to trim this. You might want to trim this particular end. But you know what? I'm not doing any of this trimming because I think this looks pretty good. I think we can proceed with it. You also have the per sequence quality scores, and that's showing the subset of sequences that have low quality value. And these look all pretty good. Now we have a significant warning at the per base sequence quality. What that's looking for is it expects the A's and T's to be somewhat similar and the C's and G's to be somewhat similar. And when you vary outside of that, it starts throwing warnings. So if it's more than 10%, it's going to do this warning. And you can see at this very beginning, up to about 15, you've got this part where things don't look right. The A's and T's are not similar. This is where they're all united. And the C's and G's aren't similar. This is probably an adapter that could be trimmed off. The GC quantity, it's looking across the whole length of the sequence and looking at the percent that's GC. And so, you know, if I think it's more than 15% of the reads do not fall within the curve, it throws a warning. And if it's more than 30%, you would get the red X here. But I'm not going to worry about it. So you can see that the theoretical distribution is here. And these are the red. Now, some organisms have higher GC content than others. So it doesn't worry me so much at this point. But if you knew something about a specific organism, it might worry you at that. The per base N content is looking for the points in the sequencer that it couldn't figure out if it was an A, a T, a C, or a G. And it called an N. And so you'd be worried that something was going on here but this didn't have any of those. The sequence length distribution, remember it was 5 to 305, and this just shows you that there are a low number of ones of smaller length, and then most of them are the longer length. Now, sequence duplication levels. Generally, when something is being sequenced, you expect that there will be only one sequence that you wouldn't have things being duplicated. But this one has a warning that there are some duplications. 
And if you have a lot of plasmids and stuff, you might see a lot of duplicated because they're replicating really quickly. So this is just giving you an indication that there is some duplication here. And so if it's more than 20% of the sequences are duplicated, you get the exclamation point. If it's more than 50%, you get the dreaded red X. Overrepresented sequences, we didn't have any, we're good. It looked for the normal adapters or you know the usual suspects, it didn't see any. This may have had a unique adapter because we could see that at the beginning of the sequence. So all in all, I think these look great and we're gonna go on with it. So we can go up here to Raw Reads, click on this again. Keep in mind what it looked like for the forward strand. And let's just briefly look at the reverse strand. And I just wanna show here, you notice that the quality dips down a lot more quickly with the reverse strand in this sample you know, that generally happens in all the samples. So only would I be worried about this if it was all here in the red and the forward strand was all in the green. But don't be alarmed when you see this. This is something that's pretty common. So let's click up in the breadcrumb and go to the fast QC results. And then we have the host removed reads. So let's click on that. And then we have the same thing. So it's the fast QC report for the host removed reads. And if you'll remember, the pipeline does that too. So this is where those reads are found. You would expect them to look the same thing because they were all sequenced at the same time. We can look at it briefly and yeah, no surprises there. So let's go back up to the folder that had everything. This breadcrumb up at the top is really convenient. So let's click on that. Now the FASTQC were the quality results, but these are the results of aligning the reads to the host genome. So let's click on that folder and it opens it up. It's got the host removed reads. When I initially submitted this job, I said I wanted the reads aligned to the human host and these are saved in this particular folder if you want to see them or use them. You could run these in a taxonomic classification job and see how successful it was at removing just host only reads. So you could look at that. And this is the SAM file. And look, this is really big. These are the reads. You could look at this. You could map this to a host genome not necessarily in BBBRC, but this is the file that does that, showing that alignment. So this is all the stuff that's host. All right, and we're not gonna look at any of that because I'm not gonna align it to the host genome. And these are just read files. So let's go back in the breadcrumb, click on that. And now, now we get to go to the Kraken output which was the next part of that pipeline. So I'm gonna click on that. Remember that Kraken matches the reads to the best location in the taxonomic tree, but it doesn't show the abundance. And the abundance is something that Bracken does. So we're just, it'll point to something, but it won't tell you how much of it is there. So when we look at the Kraken output, we can see the classified reads and the unclassified reads. Remember, I said when I submitted this job, just because I wanted to show you absolutely everything that you could do, we could save the classified reads and save the unclassified reads. So you've got all these extra reads that you can use in downstream things if you want. You could take them to metagenomic binning. You could run taxonomic classification on them again. There are a number of things you can do with them if you so choose. And if you would choose to do those over the raw reads, whatever melts your butter, all the reads are here. Now we also have the Kraken report and the Kraken output. This output is for download, it's really big. But this is showing you the highlights of the sample. So I'm gonna open this up. 
And so it opens this table with all of this stuff, all of these columns, and it doesn't have any column heads. So like you, I was thinking, what the heck's going on here? But don't worry, we're going to step through this. I'm just going to highlight one of the rows, and we're going to step through the column heads. So the first one shows the percentage of fragments, which are the reeds, the percentage of fragments covered by the clade, which is Haemophilus, rooted at this taxon. So when it's in crack in 29, almost 30% of the reeds map to Haemophilus. The next column shows you the number of reeds covered by the clade rooted at this taxon. The next column shows you the number of reeds directly mapped to this taxon. Phew, okay. Percentage, and then we have reads here, okay? And then we get into minimizers. We talked about that a little bit in the first recording, but Kraken 2 uses minimers to make things run faster. They're called Elmers. And while a Kamer is a unique thing, several Kamers can be covered by a minimizer. So this is showing the number of minimizers in the read data associated with this taxon. And the next one is the distinct minimizers in the read data associated with this taxon. I know, it's just the distinctions between them. So it's a lot to take in. Next, you have the rank code. So D is for division, P is for phylum, C is for class, O is for order, F is for family, G is for genus, and S is for species. So this is showing that Haemophilus is a genus, and 724 is the taxonomic ID assigned by NCBI, and then we have the scientific name. So you've got everything here. And remember the Kroner report and the same key plot? What if you wanted to find something specific? So I could do a control F for a find and write in streptococcus and it would start looking at that. So remember we could see some of those reads here. And then you could see how much of that was actually mapping to streptococcus. From the Kraken report, it wasn't that much, but we did see some in those two plots. So that's it with the Kraken output. And I'll, we'll just look at Kraken output again just to show you that most of it is reads and the output reports. Now let's go up one and we're going to finish off with the Bracken output. So let's click on that. Now, Bracken, Bracken, Kraken. Oh, yeah, it's hard to say that fast five times. Bracken is allowing estimates at the species level. So the percent matching will look a little bit different. Remember that the output file is just for downloading and the report is for viewing. And so here we are again, at least this format should be similar to you. And it's uh, at it's a little bit truncated compared to Kraken. This is the percent of reads that map to this taxon. And notice right away it's higher. Remember, it's looking at the abundance, whereas Kraken was just looking at the overall diversity across all the samples. So this is taking it a step further and saying, hey, there's a lot of Haemophilus in this sample. These are the number of reads mapped to the clade, the number of fragments assigned directly to this taxon. So why is it zero? I don't understand because Kraken looks at species. It's trying to get things to the species level. So for Haemophilus influenzae, here's where you're seeing, these are the number of reads mapped to the taxon here. So you've got more here. It's telling you it's a species the NCBI taxon ID, and then the scientific name. So we go back up in the breadcrumb. We handle all of these different reports. 
And then in the last video, we did everything else. Remember this multi-QC report? Let's click on this really quickly and look at this again. Remember that it was showing you the differences between Kraken and Bracken in these things. The Kraken report and the Bracken report. And this just emphasizes to you that there's a difference between Bracken and Kraken and Kraken is digging down into the species and Kraken is doing more of the overall. So this is a nutshell in which we have everything. In the next video, we'll talk about what the things look like when we submit more than one read file. And not only will we have alpha diversity, we'll have beta diversity too. So something else to keep you waiting in anticipation. I'll see you then.